<clears throat> the uh, see who's come the farthest. Who thinks they've come the farthest? How far are you? Rowlett. I think someone's got you beat. Yeah. <laughs> What's the farthest somebody came? Where's the guy I just talked to? 70 miles? Where was the guy? San Marcos. There you go. That's got a, that's got a win, right? San Marcos. Thank you for coming. The, uh, appreciate everybody being here. We are, uh, um, there's, I got a shout out to my wife. There, this is the Georgian theme, right? So she did all these Georgian things. We got the, the, the Philadelphia, what is it? Cheesesteak things? Liberty Bell pretzels, yeah. There you go. What was the other thing you had? The Germantown um, Rock Bar. There you go. Baker Oatmeal Raisin Cookies. There you go. So uh, we're all themed out. Um, the uh, so what I wanted to do was uh, thank you all for coming. First of all, um, this is just something we want to. We think we've got some fun information to share, and we just want to have a good time talking about Georgian building stuff. Um, we're going to dig into uh, um, kind of what builders were like and what they knew, and and and, and everything like that. I want to shout out to. Uh, are we going live? Are we doing it? Thanks for Austin and Kristen filming this thing, putting it on YouTube. Um, the uh, uh, the sponsors, Cucum Brothers and Windsor. Uh, Ryan Mulkey, my friend in New Jersey, uh, has Cucum Lumber, and they are uh, they produce. I've designed some moldings for them, Georgian Federal Greek Revival. Um, great moldings there. Uh, they're available nationwide. They were one sponsor. Then Windsor. Uh, I've had a relationship with them for 15 years, Craig and Dave and Brian. Um, anyway, the great guys, they got the boards. I know some of you guys use the, some of their stuff. I designed their moldings as well, but they're the sponsors of this. And so thank you to those guys for doing that. Um, also just a shout out to the Modern Craftsman. I don't know if you guys follow those guys. They, are, uh, they did a shout out. And then of course the Build Show. Now. Uh, I see Sully's got his hat on. We've got a bunch of Build Show merch and stuff in there. If you want a hat, you want a t-shirt, uh, feel free to take one. I'm a contributor on the Build Show. My videos come out on Monday, so um, we always are shooting videos every week trying to get that stuff going. Um, I'm sure there's something else. Uh, sponsors. Okay, so uh, Georgian. What is Georgian, right? What is this style? What is this style of architecture? What's going on with this? This, uh, of course, it's named after King George. Um, that's why it's called Georgian style. Um, we, uh, um, it, it's, it's very symmetrical. You're gonna just see a bunch of, of Georgian pictures from different parts of the country, right? That was uh, from uh, Virginia. This is also in Williamsburg. Uh, these are commercial buildings. We'll talk a little bit about commercial construction, um, what that looked like. This is Independence Hall. That's the Carpenters Company. We'll, t uh, we'll talk about that. This is up in New England. Uh, you see that the, the Georgian style begins to change a little bit. Uh, some chinoiserie there. This is in Philadelphia again. This is the stateroom at the Independence Hall. This is from the Mid-Atlantic. This is the Hampton Hall. Um, uh, another commercial building in uh, Rhode Island, right? These are, these are all Georgian uh, styles, full panel walls. And so there are, there are details and there are elements of the Georgian style that we kind of readily recognize. Um, this is kind of maybe what we think of when we think of Georgian, right? It's just that uh, if you Googled Georgian plans, right, something like this might come up. This is uh, uh, Westover, I believe. It's in Virginia. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really nice Georgian house. Now, the things that we're going to be studying today are, uh, are you know, super nice, okay? In other words, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, we are really studying the top 5% of, of houses. One, those are the houses that, that stayed. Um, some of the early settler houses were literally, you know, wood driven into the ground and, you know, mud floors and a, and a, uh, a sod roof. And so th those things didn't stay, right? Those things uh, fell apart and they weren't expected to stay. They weren't expected to, to, to last. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to dig into this Georgian. We're going to talk about um, 
this house style. We're going to talk about how it was built. We're going to talk about builders. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on William Buckland. He's one of my heroes. Uh, he was a builder in, in, in Annapolis and in Virginia, um, uh, a great builder. We're going to just talk about his story and how he started his company and what he did and how he worked. Um, talk about commercial versus residential. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time on masonry. And so what I want to do as we go through this kind of course, and we got another one coming in, Jan in July um, and another one in August. Uh, the next one will be federal style, and then the next one will be Greek revival. It'll be really fun to see how, it'll be fun for me, it'll be fun to see how these styles change. Now, this is kind of a, a quick overview of kind of where we are. There's American architectural history. Okay, we're right here, this Georgian style. Okay, we got federal Greek revival, Civil Wars here, got Victorian arts and crafts, period revival, World War II, and then the ranch and the early crap building after that. <laughs> um, so the Revolutionary War here is here, right? Uh, we become a country after that. Everything before 1780, 1775 is considered colonial, right? So uh, when you hear the colonial style of architecture, it tends to mean Georgian federal, right? Even some Greek revival will be uh, colonial. But truly, colonial is really the when we were colonies, right? When we were uh, uh, colonies of England and France and, Sp and, and, and Spain, um, that was really what colonial architecture is. We're going to be studying Georgian in this period, okay? So, um, Here's an overview of what, what the world looked like in 1760, right? Um, consider that, we, that the, that the uh, America is over 100 years old, okay? Jamestown and then Williamsburg were 1625, 1632, right? Those are happening kind of in this area of the country. Uh, the population in 1760 is a million, 1.5 million, right? Um, you see it broken out over these different areas, and, and the, the research I was doing was basically that there's New England, the middle colonies, and the southern colonies. New England is basically everything north of New York, right? Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. The middle colonies are kind of New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then the southern colonies start kind of Virginia, Maryland, and goes, goes south. And so you see the different uh, populations, 447, 374, and 726 in the different colonies, right? You need to realize that the five major cities in this time were, you know, Boston, New uh, Newport, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston, okay? Now, Philly was the biggest at 19,000, right? Newport was the smallest at 6,000. Those together, 60,000, right? So, you know, less than 5% are living in cities. So most of the houses, and this is what I was saying earlier, most of the houses that we're studying are really city houses and, and, and some of these plantations and stuff, but those are the cream of the crop, right? And especially when you get into brick construction, which we'll talk about, um, that was the nicest houses and the nicest thing going on. At this time, Philadelphia is kind of the, the, the hot spot, the big town, it's the, it's the, it's the largest town. Um, Charleston may be the richest town, okay, at this time. Some of the architecture and details that come out of Charleston are just overwhelming for the size of it. A lot of Charleston gets settled by people out of the Caribbean that come to Charleston and kind of in the New World. Um, so a lot of different things going on. That's kind of where the cities are laid out. Um, just in the Mid-Atlantic, okay, this is kind of a map, right, uh, of that this area. So we're going to kind of focus in this area. Just all the things that you think about with Colonial America. Okay, so here's Baltimore up here. Uh, Annapolis is just below that. Um, all of these cities, if you'll notice, are port cities. Okay, so um, America is a, uh, <laughs> it, it is, you know, you hear about some of the religious freedoms and people, but this is about money. Okay, this is about making money. And these, uh, Everything is going to be close to a river for transportation. Everything is going to be close to something. Even the, 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 the plantations that we're talking about will be right on the river. They were work centers. They were areas where work happened. Here's Williamsburg, Jamestown down here, right? So all of these things would have been easily accessible by ship um, so that they were trading and in tobacco and into the different things they were doing. 
Um, there are uh, building styles are driven by local materials, right? You weren't getting Vermont slate in Charleston, right? You weren't getting, you know, you know, stone from Mexico, right? It was, it was, it was you. You were using what you had locally to do. So, in the Mid Atlantic area, right? They have tons of clay. Okay, so masonry ends up being much more important here than it does in New England, right? Where in New England they have just trees out the, you know, so they have too many trees, and so they make everything out of the wood. So. The architecture then begins to be uh, interpreted in those materials. Uh, we're going to see the skill of the craftsman is, is really located around cities. You're not going to find people that are going to go out to a farm to try to start a business. Think about being a trim carpenter and, you know, where do you go for the work? Well, you're going to go where people are, so you're going to be in the cities. Uh, there are regional differences. If you study furniture, you know that the, you know, the Boston High Boy and the Philadelphia High Boy and the Newport High Boy are all different. The ball and cloth feet are different. Same kind of differences that you'll see with here where you'll see uh, regional skill differences, the way they use trim differently. And so there are regional differences that happen. And then the, the crazy thing about this period is everything is handmade. And so if you think about um, <laughs> that, and uh, glass was hand blown, right? Bricks were, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the bricks and how they were made. The hardware, uh, I brought a, we get some of this hardware made um, by a blacksmith in Philadelphia or outside of Philadelphia and making these things by hand and then of course doing the brass ones, right? That all of these things and all of these fixtures would be, uh, you know, forged out of raw materials, would have been uh, hammered, smoothed, sawn um, and and completely done by hand the fact that you can make this kind of beautiful element completely by hand kind of blows me away in an era where you know everything's made by the machine so um, nails were made by hand um, you know the story is that you know buildings were literally burned down so they could get the nails right because nails were so valuable um, they talk about home industries where people will actually have you know, be making nails in the winter so that they can, you know, use them. Um, shingles, the fact that, that shingles in, 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 uh, in Virginia and things like that, they couldn't afford copper or they didn't have the metal for the valleys and things like that. So all of those valleys and all those things were made by hand and then hand shaped so that the valley of a, of a house would be uh, done differently. So everything's made by hand. It's kind of a crazy era. Now, before we get too much into building, I want to talk about design influences because it's really important. Um, everybody heard of Andre Palladio, another one of my heroes, right? Um, has everybody heard of Andre Palladio? Okay, just a few. So Palladio was a stonemason in Italy. Um, he uh, started out as a stonemason. He, he falls under the, the care of this guy, Tresino, who basically looks at him and says, that's a talented kid, I'd like to help him out. Tresino takes Palladio under his wing and educates him, trains him, and, and really uh, kind of elevates him. Takes him to Rome, goes to Rome, and, and begins to look around going, oh my gosh, what is going on here? And falls in love with Rome, falls in love with the, with the buildings and the design stuff. And so he is the most influential architect of all time. That's probably not an exaggeration. I don't think it's an exaggeration. He is, his, his building and his architectural styles and the things that he did have changed the way we look at things. He went to Rome and actually got up on buildings and actually uh, studied their proportions and their details. He fell in love with the, the, the Roman stylings and was amazed by them, was looking at these ruins going, what was going on here? And, and, and some of the conversations that people were having, remember Rome falls in 300, 400. Um, you go through the Middle Ages and now we're back into the Renaissance, 14, 1500s, right? It's been almost a thousand years, over a thousand years since Rome kind of ruled. And if you look at, you know, the Forum, which was the, which was the center of Rome, and you look at this print from uh, Paranese, um, this was called the cow fields, the Campo Vicino, right? Um, essentially, here's Rome, right, and the main center of everything else. Peter gets crucified outside, outside of the city. So the Vatican City and all that stuff it happens outside of Rome. The inside of Rome just kind of goes into ruin, okay? So 
this is basically an architectural salvage yard, right? Where they are taking the, the marble and they're taking the, they're peeling these buildings away, using them to make lime, using them to, to build other things. The church was, you know, going through all of these buildings, taking them down to build cathedrals. And so um, this is where, you know, uh, um, uh, Palladio sees, right? And he sees these buildings, and he's looking at these things, and he begins to study the proportions because at that time there was the, they discovered a book caught by Vitruvius, who was a Roman architect, engineer, and he had written a book about the, uh, the genre or the, the uh, gender and the stylings of these, uh, the, the, of these architectural styles. So you had Ionic, uh, Tuscan, and, and uh, Doric, and Corinthian, architecture and they're all based on this human body and all of a sudden there was these golden proportions and and details about the stylings that that everybody's like they're what what's going on so everybody's studying these ancient ruins going oh my gosh look at these proportions look at these details so this building the pantheon was one of those buildings that was uh astounding to people in the renaissance how did they make a freestanding dome that, that uh, was, wasn't supported by anything else. So they look at the dome and they're like, how did they do that, right? And so they are studying these buildings going, what is going on here? Realize that when Brunelleschi built his dome in Florence, that's the first freestanding dome that's been built um, since, since the Pantheon was built. So they were looking at this stuff, trying to learn how to build. Now, that's what Palladio is doing, okay? He begins to build up in Vicentia, okay? Now, Venice is up here, right? Rome's down here. This is where he was traveling. Okay, Vicentia is, is actually about uh, 50 minutes from, from Venice. Vicentia was Venice uh, tradesmen, okay? Venice used to be a big port and made all their money because people were coming through Venice to go to uh, Asia. When they started going around the Horn and everything else, Venice stops having that trade money and they move out to the country and they begin to ask for houses and so Palladio is asked by these homeowners to build them houses and after his studies of Rome he basically invents a house style okay so he invents this kind of the the what you might recognize as the English country house he he does this for these for these uh, rich merchants and rich landowners in Vicentia. And basically what it was, it was an elevated country house, okay? It was, a, uh, it was a house where you had this working level, right? Where all the, these were farms, right? And so hay and cows and other things might be stored at these lower levels and in this working area. But then above that, in the Piano Noble, in that upper area, that's where the family lived. And so he invents this house style, right? And you're gonna see this form of main thing, wings, and then the, the two outer wings that are balanced over and over again um, because the English fall in love with this. The English look at this and go, that's the greatest thing because we're building our country house. And there's no, we are the new Rome, you know, right? We're the great country, so we need to be building the new Rome in England, and they begin to uh, build their houses. Now, this is uh, Villa Rotunda, a very important house, uh, in Vicentia that he built. This is Chiswick House, okay? This is Lord Burlington. He went to Italy, studied Palladio, went, oh my gosh, I gotta have that. Built this house after Villa Rotunda, which has four sides, just like Villa Rotunda. I'm showing you this because this is how important it was to uh, English things to be copying Palladio. And of course, this magnificent house where you see all these classical elements and classical details, right, laid out after Palladio. Now, in America, what are they looking at, right? They are looking at English pattern books. They are looking at English books going, you know, what should I build? This is Drayton Hall in South Carolina. It originally looked like this. Palladian Villa, right? With the, these wings that go out on either side, they've now found these things. I visited this house probably 10 times. And you know, the first time I went, you didn't see any of the wings, but they've now excavated the wings and they've got them kind of blocked out where they would have been. So this was a Palladian building. It's like 1740, so this is really pretty early. But you have guys looking at this, and then I've got these, uh, by the way, all this information, I'm just regurgitating information, you know that? Um, these are the books that I'm using to kind of try to figure things out and try to learn all this stuff. The best book, and the one that you probably ought to read if you like this stuff, 
is this book called Chesapeake House. It's an incredible book talking about all about the history, how things were made in that colonial era. Um, but they talk about these books, okay? So this would be, these are reprints of these kind of pattern books that would have come out of England, right? Uh, Vitruvius, uh, James Gibbs, okay? These are the pattern books, and if you look in these books, you see these style houses laid out because they were, everybody was influenced by Palladio. Um, so, um, let me just catch up here. Any questions about any of this so far? I got you spellbound. Um, so other design influences at this time would have been, um, uh, you know, the, the pattern books like this, okay, Palladio's books. There was, there was traveled people, okay? There was gentry who had, who had traveled to England and seen things that would, that would be consulted for design and consulted for things like that. Uh, they might be, but builders really were a big influence to, to how things were built. This is Carter's Grove. This is one of the more famous houses. This was the first workman's house, and then they built this onto it later, and we'll come back to that, and I'll show you that. This is, I'm down on the James River side, looking back up at Carter's Grove. It looks very genteel now, right? In the time, remember, this is a, a center of commerce, right? This is a center of, of work. So this would have been filled with spices and tobaccos and, and blacksmith working. And this was a, a mini city, right, that, that we see now. We kind of, we don't realize how they worked. But, but that's how this would have built. This is, again, another very early house in Virginia and the way that would have laid out. Now, we're going to study my hero, uh, William Buckland. Um, but you need to understand that um, uh, in America, okay, um, the builders were influential. It was thought that there was these gentry that, that, that ordered the books and had the books and, and figured out how things should be built, and the builders were just kind of following orders. It actually is my research is that these guys actually were, you know, uh, leading the effort on, on design and everything else, and William Buckland's a good example. Now... His story is, is that uh, Buckland was trained as a, uh, a, uh, a carpenter, an apprentice in England, okay, and actually in London. So, excuse me, that was a big deal because he would have been trained by the best. His, 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 uh, his uncle was actually a joiner. Now, a joiner is someone who joins boards together. So. A joiner would be uh, basically a trim carpenter today. He might be making cabinets. He might be doing stuff. If you ever heard that saying that he's a joiner, it's more a trim carpenter than a framer, okay? That's who he traveled. Who, that's who he would have studied under. That's who he would apprentice under. He became an indentured servant. So uh, Thomas Mason, his dad, uh, George Mason, was building a house in Virginia, and they needed someone to come finish it out. And so he says to Thomas, hey, will you find me someone that, that would come work for us? And he creates an indentured servant clause, okay? An indentured servant, don't think of chains and being a, being a servant that way. Be, indentured servant is basically a contract where guys basically said, uh, I'll come work for you for four years. You're going to pay me this much money. In return, you're going to bring me over from England uh, to America. His indentured servant contract with Mason was pretty good. He was paid about 20 pounds a year, which isn't a ton of money, but considering that um, sometimes these indentures, they all they have was room and board, the fact that he was paid a fee on top of it was something. He comes to Gunston Hall and begins to finish it out. It's thought that the masonry and the walls were already built at this point. And so he, he begins and starts his business in, uh, in Virginia, working for uh, George Mason, and then he moves to uh, Annapolis after that. Now this is Gunston Hall, okay? This is about 1740s, 1750s. This is the interior side of it. I mean, the elevation and the details here are really rich, really nice. Um, you look in the dining room, right? Uh, incredible carvings and incredible details. Now, uh, Buckland was a carver, okay? So it's thought he's carved some of these things, but carving wasn't such a rare commodity that no one did it. So it's thought he had a carver or two on his staff. 
Um, but he would have organized these people. He would have laid all this work out. He would have used these latest pattern books and design books to come up with these designs and these tiles and then executed it. Uh, in the sitting room, there's this chinoiserie, right? This Chinese influence of the design and things like that. So think about this is in Virginia in the you know, 1750s. Uh, you know, talk about calling your neighbors and coming over to look at my house, right? He is, you know, uh, Buckland is blowing it out of the park, right? He, he is showing people how buildings should look. And it's, he ends up building quite a business and quite a reputation in the area and stays very busy. It's sad because Buckland dies when he's 40. Uh, he, he, does, he, he's moved, he moves to Annapolis when he's uh, 34, so he's uh, about six years in Annapolis. Um, but he comes over when he's 20, so he's in Virginia about 14, 15 years. And then he moves to Annapolis and then he dies. When he dies, he has uh, a library of 14 building books, okay? Now, in this period, it, you know, not a lot of people read, right? Not a lot of people were illiterate. It's interesting, I've got a, a, uh, a note from one of my researches, 1740, okay? The London Tradesman, um, this is 1747, is talking about builders um, and the carpenters employed in the wooden work from the foundation to the top. He ought to have solid judgment in the matters of this kind, in, in other words, in building. Um, it re, he requires a strong, robust body and a hale constitution. Not sure what that means, but uh, he must read English, write a tolerable hand, and know how to design his work, okay? So this gives us a hint about what these guys knew, right? That they uh, were not illiterate, they, were not, were, they weren't knuckleheads, they, they actually knew how to design, they knew how to read, and they were reading these design books, these pattern books like that, to come up with and execute designs like this. This is his house in uh, uh, Annapolis, it's called the uh, Hammond Hardwood House. It's very famous, it's thought to be inspired by this Villa Passini, uh, which is a Palladian house. You can see that inspiration does not mean an exact copy, right? He wanted to do these octagonal fronts here. That's not seen here. Obviously, they built a kind of an attic level over there that isn't executed. The pilasters on the front, some of the other things. You don't know whether those things are driven by the customer. Hey, I don't really want to go that crazy. Or whether it's just, no, no, I'm inspired by that, but I actually want to, want to see it executed this way. Um, this is considered his you know, magnum opus. Um, it's a fabulous house. If you haven't seen it, you can still go through it. Um, this doorway, Jefferson said when he toured through here in the early 1800s, he said this is the most beautiful doorway in all of America, right? So um, it was copied from an Abraham Swan book. This was the inspiration. You can see that uh, Buckland actually did an, an, did an arch top not, not, and did, did, added much more carving. So typically they're dressed down. Actually, Buckland kind of dresses things up. Uh, there are sketches of Jefferson trying to draw this entry and trying to look at it saying, this is awesome, and, and, and trying to sketch it out. And in the federal period, we're going to talk a lot about Jefferson because he was kind of a nightmare homeowner, if you, <laughs> if you want to do it. He, he knew enough to be dangerous, and he fiddled and played. And anyway, we'll get into Jefferson. But uh, Jefferson loved this entry and was completely inspired by it. But you see the execution of this work and zooming in on the, on the pediment at the top, uh, the cartouche and this carving in the window. It's pretty fabulous, right? It's, it's pretty amazing. You understand why he's one of my heroes. Um, so the business of carpentry, okay? Um, and I think the best way to study that is to talk about the Carpenters Company in Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia being the biggest city, um, it is... Uh, uh, well, any questions about Buckland before we move on? To, yeah. When you look at American Georgian architecture, and you look at English architecture of the same period, which had various names, the English architecture of the same period is much more ornate. It is. And detailed, much more flourishing. Why, is, if they were using English books as pattern books, why is there such a dramatic difference? Is it the money or is it? I, I mean, I, so if you go to the Philadelphia Museum, uh, they have a bunch of rooms that were collected in the 20s and they have these English rooms. And they're, to your point, they're 
<laughs> head and shoulders above the quality and, and the size of them is bigger. Um, and I think the size of those estates and those country homes were bigger. Um, the, I, I, my, yeah, my, my, uh, there, there are examples and little spots of greatness in America, but it's all over England. And when I toured there and went to some of those Georgian houses, the level is, you know, two or three steps above what you see in America. I think it's money. I think it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, inside of Carter's Grove, which was one of the richest houses, or the Miles Bruton house um, in, uh, in Charleston, there's some levels of detail that you're like, holy cow, I don't think I've seen anything like this. Now, you would see that in London, but there are a spattering of houses, just, just not the same level. And, you know, I think it's money, would be my guess. So, the uh, Carpenters Company of Philadelphia, there's, there's this book, if you wanna read more about it, uh, Carpenter's Company of the City and County of Philadelphia, the 1786 rule book. Now, it's kind of a fun story. Uh, basically, the historian for the Carpenter's Company was look, rummaging around in the attic of this building and found an old box and found these, these, uh, this rule book for builders. Now, what that means is, is that the rule book was how to charge and how to estimate things as a builder. And so these guys in about 1724, 1720, get organized and say, you know what, we're going to, um, uh, we're going to, uh, business is going so fast, there's so many new apprentices coming into Philadelphia, we've got to, you know, uh, get together and kind of form a union, right? It's a little bit of a union, it's a little bit of a trade group, it's a little bit of a thing. Now, go back to London and England and the guilds, right? There is an apprenticeship system and journeyman and master system in England that, that falls apart after the Great Fire of 1666. So um, as building happens and things like that, a lot of these guys are coming over to America and in Philadelphia, they organized into what's kind of a guild, kind of a union. The, the, this was set up so that they could, you know, if someone died, they, they paid the, the widow a, a pension. Um, and so they paid into this thing, but it also protected them. These guys were very well uh, connected. <laughs> and so they're... Um, they were they they worked for the city and they like they 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 were like the zoning officers and yeah you built over this building line you built over that building line so they were really well connected right uh, and important as far as how building happened in 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 Philadelphia they uh, um, they worked a number of different ways they worked with a day rate which is like an hourly rate okay they would work by a measure okay they work which is basically a unit price or they worked as a kind of a progress completion kind of thing where there wasn't really a, a fixed price but they were getting paid by that the amount of work that they did so um, you know work happened a number of different ways this is what their 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 price book looked like and realized that this was a very secretive book um, uh, it was said when the when someone died, they went to the widow's house and said, "Hey, we need our price book back." Uh, Jefferson in the 1800s, he said he wanted a a copy and he couldn't get one. So right, and if you're Thomas Jefferson, you can't get one. It's a secret book. Um, notice that in the second page, it talks about drawings. Drawings designed make out of making out bills of scantling, collecting materials and slit sticking up stuff are to be charged by the carpenters in proportion to the trouble. <laughs> so in other words, they were doing drawings, okay? There really aren't drawings at this stage. Certainly getting eight pages or 20 pages or 100 pages of drawings didn't happen in this period. Even famous buildings like Independence Hall, they don't have the plans for that. Um, there's, there's pictures that I, that I had where, you know, a mantle was drawn on the back of a board and then that board was used inside the house. They found it later. So certainly seeing elevations wasn't happening. And so when you were building a house like this, you would say, here's the floor plan. This is kind of what I'm looking for. And you would just work it out. So um, if there are plans, they don't exist anymore. And the plans that we do know about might have two or three pages. In this book, they had everything broken out, right? And so pounds, shillings, and, and pennies. By these things, I picked a page that actually had a very expensive thing, right? And they do everything from uh, door jams, different type, types of door jams, moldings. You know, this, 
window uh, um, dormer, right, was seven, seven pounds, uh, 10 shillings, okay? One of the more expensive things we, we had at this time, uh, the, the siding on the side was an extra, extra amount of money, the window was an extra amount of money. This is probably a 20 or 30 pound piece, right? All completely dud. Now, my quick math is that uh, builders were getting about, a journeyman were getting between 240 and 300 uh, pounds a year. Okay, so about a pound a day. And so, you know, if this is, you know, 20 pounds, this is a few weeks of work, right? And so, anyway, uh, it's kind of interesting looking at this and then seeing that, and you know, this is like, you know, 10 shillings, right? So, um, anyway, it's kind of, kind of interesting. I think it's interesting. Um, commercial construction. Yes, there was commercial construction. Um, what it looked like is realize there's very few commercial buildings, right? You have churches, state houses, um, you know, we're pretty much the commercial construction. And when these happened, they were built by and designed by committees, or they were designed by committees, run by committees, paid by committees, but often built by master builders. And co so Independence Hall was the Philadelphia State House. And basically they said, hey, we want a, uh, we need a state house for Philadelphia. Let's put some money aside. Let's form a committee. Committee was made up of three or four guys. Each of those guys, it appears from the letters, went out and, and kind of came up with their own design. And then they got back together. They argued about it. One guy won and he, he ends up having this design. Uh, and then they go to the carpenter's company, right? The well-connected builders and the carpenter's company builds the, builds the building. And then uh, the, the committee is the one that pays it out. It took about 10 years to build. So, uh, you know, commercial construction, I guess it's a little bit like it is today. If a church was building, that building, they'd form a committee, they'd get together, they'd figure out the plans. The architect really, you know, uh, was the builder in this stage, realized that the Georgian period is kind of the last period of the master builder architect person. It's after this in the federal period, you have architects come about. You have uh, uh, Benjamin Latrobe, who's a, who was in uh, Baltimore. He comes in, uh, you know, you have Bullfinch in, in, uh, um, in Boston. So the uh, architect that all he does is do drawings and kind of and does that stuff really wasn't around in this period. So it was a committee and, and then master builders who were building at this time. Uh, Faneuil Hall, this is the original Faneuil Hall. It was rebuilt with Bullfinch in the 1800s, um, but it was a market hall, okay? So this was on near the wharf. Um, it was a big market center below. They had a state house or a meeting room above, which obviously became very important during the uh, Revolutionary War. But these were, you know, these buildings and the civic buildings they built, except when they were churches, were oftentimes for commerce. And that's how this was built, and it was built the same way by committee. Um, any questions on any of that before I jump into masonry? So what I want to do with, with each session is spend a little bit of time on, uh, you know, the, the craftsmanship in the building and in the, in the art of building. Um, I, I think it bugs people sometimes when I say we, we've forgotten how to build. Um, but I think we've forgotten how to build. And I, I don't mean it uh, in a bad way. I just mean when I look at the way they used to construct and I look at the way houses used to be put together and I see the quality in the design, I go, oh, okay. And as I study the old rules and I study the things, I go, okay, yeah, no, there are a lot of things we've forgotten. And that's what I mean. Now, this is what masonry and brickwork, firing bricks looked like. Let me explain what's going on here. Basically, in the mid-Atlantic, they, they had a ton of clay, right? You would do it when you're big and digging a basement, you just hit clay and all of a sudden you've all you've got is clay. And so clay was basically taken out of the ground, cleaned, because there are sticks and muds and shells and different things in it. They would clean it and then they'd put it into a big you know, bucket and then they would have people step on it. And it was called treading out. And they would, they would basically work the, uh, uh, the clay they put a little bit of water into it and they would work it into like a Play-Doh, okay? Once they got into a Play-Doh, they, they had wood molds. So this is where wood molded bricks come from. <clears throat> they would sand the wood mold and they would throw the mud into the, to the thing and carefully lay the brick out. Let the brick dry for a week, a few weeks, a month, maybe longer. Um, and then when they, when they were 
dry and somewhat hard, they would, be, they would begin to make a kiln, okay? Now, realize that th this, is what, this is called a clamp, okay? Now, a clamp is a kiln made at a job site. Now, most of the houses like Carter's Grove or some of these great plantation houses would not have shipped brick, okay? There weren't really brickyards in 1740 you would have built bricks on site. And so you would have find, find a, a, a brick uh, master who could actually build the kiln and actually know how to fire these things. And then you would you know, pull this thing away and you'd make it. Now, you know, think about hauling bricks today in a, in, a two by tr in a truck with a trailer and things like that. They had a horse and wagon, right? So you're not hauling bricks, right? You know, down these bumpy roads that aren't paved. So making bricks on site made a lot of sense. Essentially what they do is you see that there's kind of two rows of bricks and there's about a half an inch between each row. And you see this thing that goes out in between? That's what you're looking at here, right? These aren't the, the same thing. And so you would stack these bricks up, right? And then you would build this kind of chamber around. It was open at the top and you would mud the whole thing. And then you would start this fire underneath there and you would slowly raise the temperature inside this clamp and that heat was coming up through here, right? Baking these bricks and things like that. And then for four or five days to get it up to about 2000 degrees, okay? And then about another week or so letting it cool down, okay? Now, <laughs> realize that they had very wildly different results with bricks, okay? They had waste sometimes of 30, 40, 50% of the bricks lost. Now you've heard of clinker bricks and you've heard of different things like that. Basically, because these ovens and these clamps, if you didn't have a good mason, you didn't know what he was doing, um, you would have a lot of waste here. Some bricks were too soft, some bricks were too hard, some bricks became clinkers, right? And so you have this wild variety of different bricks that come out of a kiln that you have to then sort and move around and figure out. Now, there became all kinds of different bonding, pa bonding patterns. And a bonding pattern is, um, uh, you got these different walls, okay? So a bond is where you bond two walls together. So uh, in a 12 inch wall or an eight inch wall, you need to bond, otherwise you're gonna be building these two brick walls that are, that, are, that are just gonna be floating separately. You have to bond those walls together so that the whole thing can lock together, right? And so they have these different bonding patterns that you lay out and you see this American, English, and Flemish. Now in the colonial period, there's only English and Flemish bonds. And you'll see that here, okay? So where's my Flemish bond? Um, see this here? So a Flemish bond is when you, get, when you have a runner and a header, runner, header, and then they alternate, right? So that, you, so that it, it kind of goes up. It makes a different pattern and a different detail on the brick. See this little brick here? Those are glazed headers. And basically sometimes in the firing, it got so hot it actually glazed the end of the brick. And that became a feature in the early era where it was very desirable to have these uh, header bricks that were glazed. Uh, an English bond has all these headers going across and then it has a couple courses and then another header, right? And so, um, where's my English bond, right? I guess, uh, can't see it. There's his English bond here, right? So you got all these headers, then runners, then headers. And so there was a magic to how they put these buildings together and how they bonded them. So it wasn't just laying, throwing a bunch of bricks up there. They were actually uh, using these patterns, using the different colors to kind of bond their walls together. Now, this is Carter's Grove again. This is where I was telling you this house was earlier. How do you know it was earlier? Because in the 1730s and 40s, this pattern of doing these glazed headers, right? Which what you see, you got to see Flemish bond, right? but all the glazed headers was very popular, but when they built this later, they didn't use that system anymore. Um, and and they, they, they changed it, right? The other thing that happens is that there is different ways of striking the mortar, okay? So striking the mortar means because wood molded bricks aren't perfect, okay? It's not until you get into the Victorian era that you have these perfectly shaped and, and uh, perfect squares and perfect bricks. You see fingerprints in these bricks. You see all kinds of different bricks. They're very soft as well. So 
what they did was they actually had these striking tools, okay, to help make the lines look cleaner and better. And then over here, you see a wood molded brick, and these things are very tight together. We'll talk about wood molded bricks and how they did that, where they would where make these shapes and how their the mortar joints are much tighter on these and why they are. So there's a there's a magic to these buildings, and as you look at the the entry at Carter's Grove, that they are essentially building a a, a you know, beautiful entry here, but it's like a puzzle, all these different pieces put together. Now, the other thing they did is what's called a jack arch. And a, and a brick arch or a jack arch is, remember, this is a solid masonry wall. And if I cut a hole in that masonry wall, all that brick's gonna fall down. So what has to happen is, is you're creating a giant wedge in that wall that holds those bricks out. And what's cool is, is that all of these bricks are slightly different, okay, in size, until this one right over the door is straight, and then it shapes the other way, right? So every single one of these bricks is slightly different. And then the way they, they do it, they got two, and then they got four bricks, and two, and four bricks. It creates this wonderful little pattern. The other thing they do is sometimes these mortar joints end up getting, you know, sixteenth or an eighth of an inch because these are called rubbed bricks. Now, <laughs> rubbed bricks are basically soft bricks that come out of the kiln. They collect into a, a cohesive color and then they actually literally rub them and cut them so that they, the glaze surfaces off of them and you see this even pattern and even color around the opening and so that they would cut these and, and uh, actually hand cut them and or mold them so that they had all these different shapes and how it was put together. Going back to the back side of, of William Buckland's house, the uh, Hammond Harwood house, you see all of these different patterns coming together. You have a rubbed belt course, right? You have jack arch, brick jack arches that are rubbed brick over each opening. You have molded brick. You got a, basically a pilaster here that supports this pediment, but you've got the molded brick at the top. <clears throat> the pattern, you've got a Flemish bond here and you've got an English bond here. The, there's magic of the way of putting these buildings together and thinking about the masonry and thinking about how it was not just kind of thrown together. This is where I look back at the past and go, you know, um, the opportunity we have to build great houses today, sometimes we forget, we've forgotten all of the different things that we can do, the bonding and, and just the simple changing in the bonding on a, on a house instead of doing a running bond, changing the bonding to an English or Flemish bond can be magic. And so when you think about the levels of the different things that they were doing, it's even, it's even cooler. Um, probably the best practitioner of traditional building methods is an architect named Quinlan Terry. This is a building that he did in, uh, in, in Williamsburg, Virginia. But you see him playing with the rubbed bricks, the molded bricks. But look, he made a freaking triglyph, right? Out of molded bricks, right? He's got dental, right? What in the world, right? In brick, right? Made in these different pieces and parts, all molded together, all made in the traditional method. The great story about Quinlan is uh, he did a house in Dallas, and was, I've told this story before, um, but it's a great story. He's building a house, the Muse House in Dallas, which is where the first ICA event was. And he's, uh, Larry Borders is the architect, local architect, and he introduces Terry and, uh, and he's telling this story. He says, you know, when we were building the masonry on the outside of this building, and it's a, it's a limestone masonry, he said, we had to stop because Quinlan got there and they looked at the mortar joints and the mortar joints were three eighths of an inch. He goes, the mortar joints are too big. Now, typically days three eighths to a half is about what you're doing. He goes, they're too big. He goes, what do you mean they're too big? He goes, they've got to be an eighth of an inch. He goes, if we want to make this thing last as long as it's going to last, where it'll last for you know, 250, 300 years, we've got to change these mortar joints, right? So it changed this whole perspective about how you build. Um, his thing was, the architect, said, Larry says, hey, you, you can, uh, um, uh, this house is, is meant to last 250 years without any major maintenance. And Quinlan says, no, 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 that's wrong. It's 450 years, right? So just changes the way you think about building and everything else. And then, of course, I love this edicule. This edicule here, right? See these, all these, these, this brick arch here? But that actually goes inside, right? So this, this is shaped this way. Curved work is the hardest thing to do with, with uh, woodwork and masonry, but they've got 
a jack arch here that also slopes inside, right? He's made these, uh, these are limestone obviously, but the, everything else is brick. Notice how tight those mortar joints are, right? It's just <laughs> inspirational, I think. Now, this is not Georgian. I, <laughs> I typed in Georgian plans in my, in my, in my computer. And so the, the part of the point of doing all this, right, is to highlight the challenges and the differences that we've got today with building. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to poke holes in this, but, the, um, but there are a lot of things that just, as you look at the past, that just aren't Georgian, right? This kind of little window here, shutters typically in the Georgian period were interior shutters. They didn't really do exterior shutters. This little arch thing over top, that'd be more of a federal period. This, you know, thing here is, is not really classically styled, right? And so you begin to look at it and go, if you are typing in and you aren't looking at the past and you look at things and goes, oh, well, this must be Georgian. Yeah, I can kind of see it, right? It's symmetrical, it's kind of laid out, right? The, the beauty and the fun and the opportunity for us as builders and, and designers to, is to look at the past and be inspired like we were at the masonry and kind of see what our problems are, right? And so this looks like a new house, right? But this was in their Georgian collection. And, you know, the Palladian window up here and then arch windows over here, there just isn't a strong precedent for that look in the Georgian America. So, um, you know, certainly this entry, uh, you know, this, these, these uh, large pediment side things wouldn't have been there. Um, you know, this kind of rich detailing with the, with the coins and the, and the cut stone or cast stone or however you're going to make that, is something that would have only appeared on very, very high level houses. You might have seen that on Philadelphia Hall, or you might have seen that at the Carpenters Company. But to have cut stone as kind of these elements, um, you know, it's just different. So I think the opportunity for us as we look at these designs and look at the styles and remember the Georgian style is that there's so many great things we can do, so many great design things that we can copy and cheat and steal from to build beautiful things that just be careful kind of what you're looking at when you're looking at that stuff. So, the Georgian period, right? Um, I think it's inspirational, right? It is, it is the last kind of period of the master builder as architect. Um, it is the last period of, of uh, um, well, can't find my notes. Um, sorry. It is the last period where you, where you really have houses built without plans, right? Where, where builders kind of got together with their client and said, hey, here's an idea. Uh, we need it this size by this size. You know, let's do good work, <laughs> um, which is, which is kind of fun. Um, the style of these houses is, is, is based on, you, you see this Palladian layout again, right? You see these two wings. This is Mount Airy, um, uh, a famous house. This is stone, right? So this is a very elevated house, very rich house. Um, but this is kind of that last era. And as we look at the past, I would hope we can get inspired by looking at the craftsmanship and looking at the details and, you know, long to build better because we see beautiful things like this. Any questions? How did I do on time? Brent, what, do you, what precipitated the change from builder architect to architect? And was that trend to trend? Or? Well, when we study the, the, the federal period, we'll get into a little bit more. Uh, it's growth. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of these um, pre Revolutionary War cities, right? The, the great buildings are built like 1760 into late 1760s, but by 1770 there's trouble and you don't see as many houses and we don't really come out of that to like 1790. In that time period, demand goes crazy. There's a great book called uh, Crafting Ameri Early America, all about building in Philadelphia, talking about what builders looked like, what they did. It isn't an overnight change, right? Because builders are still offering plans in the 1790s, 1800s, 1820s. But you see the rise of guys like Benjamin, Benjamin, <laughs> Benjamin Latrobe, uh, Charles Bullfinch, uh, who actually are uh, genteel men, right? They, 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 they tend to be very well-educated people. They can talk to a committee like at Philadelphia Hall. They can talk, they end up getting 
uh, better, better projects, um, building churches, building state houses, overseeing that kind of stuff. So the need of the architect, I think, is part of it, that there needs to be someone who can actually pay them in, look at the work, yes, that's good enough, and, and go from there, as opposed to trusting the builder that everything's okay. Um, so there's some of that, but it's, it's, a, it's an evolution. Realize that licensed architects aren't really around until almost 1900. So you're, you're, you know, the IA starts in like 1870. The very first school here is like 1880. So you don't really have a you know, profession of architecture until later, but certainly the rise of those guys uh, starts kind of after the Revolutionary War. Any other questions? Yeah. So at the beginning of architecture, their architects were basically um, the project managers. Which one? Architects were basically the project managers. Um, you mean? Making sure everything got done, because that's not really their role now, right? Um, well, yeah. I mean, um, uh, as far as payment. And yeah. So <laughs> the uh, in a very traditional architectural sense, and Gannon, you can correct me if this is wrong. Um, and leave. The, uh, um, you have a schematic design, design development, construction documents, okay? Then there's that last porch where it's architectural oversight, which is them checking the pay app to make sure that, they, that everything's paid, checking the work to make things going on. So there is a portion of their work that they allow for that does oversee that, okay? Most people don't end up paying for that. The most, certainly residential contracts, you don't see it very often that an architect will oversee AIA payments. On commercial projects, almost every one is overseen by an architect. But on the residential side, you just don't see that. And so, but yes, they do have that role. They're just not always paid for it, right? Any other questions? Well, thank you guys for coming to the first uh, Georgian uh, style and the first Buildings and Brew. I suspect there's a lot more food, a lot more beer, and so uh, help yourself and thank you guys for coming. Oh, the, the next one is uh, January 29th, which was July 29th, which is the, the federal style. And there's merch there, there's t-shirts and uh, hats over there.